hi everybody thanks for for coming in so promptly um i think we'll make a start because we only have 45 minutes with you and there is quite a lot of stuff that we want to cover with you today and we're going to do some hopefully fun engaging activities um, I'm Karina and I teach A-level history and classics um, and I'm also manager for the honours programme for the more able students at um, college so um, obviously like I might be seeing some of you as part of that programme and if you're interested in finding out more I can tell you later. And this is Jane. Hello I'm Jane and I'm the CTL for English um, I'm teaching GCSE Classical Civilization as well as English. And hello to some of you I know, Safa and Razan, and hello to those of you that I haven't met before. Welcome. So today, um, as I mentioned, we're going to do an introduction to both history and to classics. So we're going to have a classical focus, but obviously this is still related to ancient history. Um, and then at the end, we'll talk um, a bit about the links between both history and classics. So hopefully this will give you an introduction to something a little bit different and something quite interesting and fun. Um, let me just present my screen to everybody. And stop me at any point if you have any questions or type anything in the chat box. Um, can you see that okay there? Is that showing up, Jane? Uh, no, it's not. Is that working now? Yeah. Oh, see. excellent, great. Okay, guys, so today we're going to be looking at tragedy in ancient Greece. And we're going to be giving you a short introduction to the Greek theatre and looking at a production of Sophocles, Sophocles' play, Oedipus Rex. Um, just to give you a short introduction to Greek theatre to begin with, um, tragedies um, and indeed comedies were often performed in the open air and in daylight, and the theatre of Dionysus in Greece was the place where all of the surviving tragedies were actually performed. So in most cases, spectators at the theatre would have sat on the ground or there would have been wooden seats that were put up for the performance. And in the centre of the theatre, we have this circular arena, which you can see better if we look at the picture here. And this was known as the orchestra. So the section where hopefully you can see my arrow pointing there. So this is where the singing, dancing and theatre would take place. And then behind this, um, you would also have what we call a scheme, which is an ancient dressing room for the actors. Hopefully you can see around the outside here, and um, here is where um, the people, the audience would have actually been sitting. This is a later construction because later Greek theatres were actually built in stone rather than in wood. Um, just important to note that when we're looking at ancient theatre, they would only actually be three men who were taking part in the performance and acting, and they would each have masks for different characters in the play. Um, Greek theatre was a mix of both singing, drama, and dancing. So if you think about it in terms of being like an opera, a ballet, and a theatre, it's kind of a mix of those three things. And generally, the plays would have been written by Greek aristocrats, so the Greek upper classes. But they were performed to a large audience from across quite a wide section of society. Uh, so um, women as slaves were excluded from most of the performances, we think. But um, you would have both rich and poor people at these events. And poor people in particular were encouraged to attend because... It's not only um, a kind of um, a theatre event, a big community event, but it's also a religious event as well. So there are religious sacrifices and rituals that are performed as part of the theatrical performances as well. Um, and um, we're particularly going to be having a look at a type of drama that used to be performed um, called the Greek tragedy, which you'll kind of see remnants of in modern theatre even today. It's influenced a lot of modern plays. And they also performed comedies at these events as well. So normally what a playwright would do was to perform, say, three tragedies or two tragedies and a comedy. And the audience would vote for the winning performance, say. 
you probably have some idea of what a tragedy is if you've studied English before, and particularly if you've looked at Shakespeare, who's very influenced by these Greek plays. Um, it's basically um, a, a lot of these scenes and these plays were taken from Greek mythology, um, and which were often a part of Greek religion at this time. And there is the themes are basically about suffering and humanity, what it means to be a hero. Um, but it's also important to note that you wouldn't actually see any violent acts being performed on stage. Those acts would actually take place off of stage because this was also the site of an important religious festival. So in a lot of these plays, and particularly in Sophocles, um, what we see is we see that there's a, a lot of suffering that takes place with the lead characters and um, the events that overwhelm the heroes are not explained or justified a lot of the time. The world is often seen as a cruel place in which it's very difficult for man to kind of influence a lot of the events that are happening to him or to her. So we're going to look at an extract from a playwright, um, 5th century um, BC in ancient Greece called Sophocles, who was really the person who, the playwright who's most known for his kind of elaborate tragedies. And one of the key plays that he wrote was a play called Oedipus Rex or Oedipus the King. And I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to the play. And then we're going to read out some of the text for ourselves and explore some of the key themes of this particular tragedy. Um, Colleen, there's just a couple of questions. Mm, yes. Um, Actas asked, um, was tragedy always a genre? It was actually a genre that was invented by the ancient Greeks. And um, it's similar in some ways to Shakespeare's tragedies. But if you read something like Aristotle's Poetics, you'll also see there are some key differences. OK, but it was actually invented by the ancient Greeks. And Safa has, I have posted an answer to her, but she said, is this part of classics or history a level? Oh, yes. Yeah, th this is part of classics. OK, we actually, for, um, for um, history, we study um, 17th century British history, and then we also study um, the British Empire. So we're giving you kind of an introduction to what you could study if you studied classics. But obviously, it's a good introduction to the ancient world for those who just have a general interest in history. So here is our outline of um, the play itself. Writing's not that easy, but Grammarly can help. Excuse the adverts. This I'll sentence skip these in is grammatically correct. Very familiar with the plot of this play. Thanks to the 60 second recap, now you can be too. Think of the plot of Oedipus as a series of revelations. The oracle reveals that the plague plaguing Thebes will end when the murderer of King Laius, the former king of Thebes, is caught and cast out of the city. The prophet Tiresias tells Oedipus that Oedipus is the murderer of King Laius. Tiresias reveals that he knows Oedipus' parents, even though Oedipus grew up far away in the city of Corinth. Tiresias reveals that the murderer of Laius will turn out to be both father and brother to his own children and the son of his own wife. Jocasta, Oedipus' wife, reveals the nature of Laius' murder. He was killed at a three-way crossroads just before Oedipus' arrival in Thebes. Oedipus reveals that he may be the one who murdered Laius. Fleeing his home in Corinth, he killed an aggressive group of travelers in self-defense at a three-way crossroads. Oedipus discovers that his father in Corinth is dead, but that his father is not his biological father. A shepherd reveals that Oedipus is in fact a cast-off child of King Laius and Queen Jocasta. The prophecy is fulfilled! Horrified, the queen kills herself, and Oedipus gouges out his eyes and begs for exile. Okay, that was reasonably quick. Um, okay, but we're just going to have a look at a quick extract from the play. And just while I type that and um, just give you the link to it so you can follow along on your own computer screen. Um, I think Jane will just give you just a very quick introduction to the particular extract that we're looking at and how that fits in with the play itself. Right. I'm just answering Safa's question. <laughs> and thank you for all your questions. Some good questions coming through. I'll also display a copy of the play on the screen just in case anybody has a problem accessing the link that I'm just about to put in the chat box. So I'm going to put this link into the chat box now and hopefully um, you'll all be able to see this. 
Um, any questions that we don't have a chance to answer straight away, we will come back to at the end and make sure that we answer all of them. Okay, so I've just posted a link to the PDF of the play. And then... Um, okay, um, just before I talk about the play, um, Jack, it, no, it's not... I don't think it is a particularly difficult A-level. It's, um, it's very, very interesting. That's why we put it here. It goes really well with, with a lot of subjects, and I think especially with history, with religious studies. English literature, law. Um, uh, we, we're really excited to be hopefully offering it this year. Um, it's, it's all by exam, Marianne. And what we'll do in a bit, we're, we're going to have a look here at the play. One of the options is Greek theatre. That's why we're focusing on a Greek play. And um, it is all, it's entirely by exam. There's no coursework element of it. So as you've heard, the play is about the King Oedipus. Also, this goes very well with psychology as well. And um, it's about he, um, it, as Karina pointed out, it's a tragedy. Uh, it's a very, very brutal tragedy. And really, at the, um, I would say the crux, the main thing about the play is a, it has a moral to it. And it's about um, incest and incest being taboo. And it's a really, really um, quite traumatic in some ways, quite dramatic. Well, it's a drama, so it will be dramatic um, play. There are a lot of things that come up. A lot of you will be doing English literature. A lot of you will be familiar with Shakespeare. You begin to see where Shakespeare got some of his ideas from. Um, and after all, um, Shakespeare had tragedies and comedies and history plays as well. So what we've done is um, there's an extract of the play. Um, I, do you have your microphones? Are you able to speak? Because we will need to have, um, ideally, um, two volunteers who will help to read two of the key parts. Do you want to raise a hand if you're interested in volunteering to read? So you should be able to access here. We just put it there and it's... Um, so do we have anyone confident to read out the play? Anybody who likes performing or enjoys reading? It's not a very long extract. Okay. Um, All right, shall we pick some? Yeah, should we choose somebody? Okay, so Marion, would you be happy to, to read the part of Oedipus for us? Um, Marion? Um, okay, Jack? Okay. okay, should we have a, should we read through ourselves, Jane? Okay, right. okay, we'll read through. Okay, well, I'll put the text onto the screen and then you can just kind of follow along as we read through. But as we're reading through, if you can be thinking about what some of the key themes are that you see in the play. Basically, this part of the play is when Oedipus, um, I'll just go back quickly to the PowerPoint then. So this is where Tiresias, who's an elderly prophet, is being forced by Oedipus, who is the king of Thebes, to tell him the prophecy that Oedipus believes will rescue his city from the plague. So this is the point at which it is revealed that um, Oedipus is going to uh, marry his mother and kill his father. Um, would you like to be Oedipus, Jane? Um, okay, I'll be, I've actually been longing to, to, to speak. So we're on page three, if anybody wants to follow along separately on their computer, but I've also displayed this on the main screen, so hopefully you should be able to see that as well. Okay, so okay. Oh, yeah, that's Theresius good. enters led by a little boy. Okay, Theresius, you know much. Things teachable and things not to be spoken. Things of the heaven and earth. You have no eyes. But in your mind, you know what a plague holds our city. My Lord, you alone can rescue us. We should learn the names of those who king, killed King Laius and kill them or expel them from our country. Do not withhold from us the oracles from birds or any other way of prophecy within your skill. 
save yourself and the city and save me in this pollution that lies on us because of this dead man we are in your hands alas how terrible is wisdom when it turns against you let me go home it will be easiest for us both to go no further in this you would rob us of your gift of prophecy do you have no care for law nor love of your city of your city thieves who reared you yes but i see that your own words lead you to error therefore i must fear for mine for god's sake if you know anything do not turn from us all of you here know nothing i will not bring our troubles to the light of day what do you mean you know something and refuse to speak would you betray us and destroy the city i will not bring this pain upon us both tell us you villain of themselves things will come, even if I breathe no word of them. Since they will come, tell them to me. I will say nothing further. Let your temper rage as wildly as you will. Indeed I am angry. You must be a conspirator in the deed. If you had eyes, I would have said that you alone murdered him. Yes, then I warn you faithfully to keep your word and from this day forth to speak no word of greeting to these people nor me. You are the land's pollution. How shamelessly you taught me. Do you think you will escape? You have made me speak against my will. Speak what? Tell me again that I may learn it better. Did you not understand before? Would you provoke me into speaking? You are the murderer of the king. You shall not lie like this and stay unpunished. I say that with those you love best, you live in foul shame and do not see where you are wrong. Do you think you can talk like this and live to laugh at it there, hereafter? You are blind in mind and ears as well as in your eyes. You are a poor wretch to pile upon me insults which everyone will soon heap upon you. Was this your own design or was it Creon's? Your ruin comes not from Creon but from yourself. My one-time friend Creon attacks me secretly for wealth and power. He wants to drive me out and devises this trick with this beggar who has only eyes for his own gains, but blindness is his skill. Before I defeated the Sphinx by answering its riddle, where was your gift of prophecy then? I came and stopped her. Mine was no knowledge got from birds. And now you expel me because you think that you will find a place by Creon's throne. Then we're just going to come to the last section of the chorus. The chorus is basically um, kind of the people who comment on the play within the play. So it's a group of actors who come together and provide a moral commentary on what's going on for the audience. We look on this man's words and yours and find you have both spoken in anger. Oh, sorry, oh, that's a bit later. So we're not coming to the... Oh, yeah, we are. Oh, sorry, yeah, that was a brief yeah. section of the chorus. Sorry. <laughs> you again. I have the right not to, I have the right to speak in my defence against you. I live in the surface of Apollo, not in yours, nor Creon's. Listen to me. You have called me blind, but you have your eyes, but see not where you are in seeing. Do you know who your parents are? And of the multitude of other evils between you and your children, you know nothing. Go out of my house at once and be damned. I did not know you would talk like a fool. I am a fool then, but to your parents wise, this day will show you your birth and will destroy you. In name, he is an outsider, but soon he will be shown to be a citizen, a true native of Thebes, and he'll have no joy in the discovery. He would exchange blindness for sight and poverty for riches. He shall be proved father and brother, both to his own children in his house, to the one who gave him birth, a son and a husband both. Theresius and Oedipus exit separately, and then the chorus come back in. By Delphi's oracle, who is proclaimed the doer of deeds that remains unnamed? Now is the time for him to run. The prophet has spread such confusion. Truly, Zeus and Apollo are wise, but amongst men there is no judgment of truth or lies. I'll find no fault with a king till proven beyond a doubt. For he saved us from the Sphinx and helped us out. Then we have the short extract that we're looking at here. Um, and we'd like you now just to have a thing. Are there any questions just before we have a look at the key themes? Any questions about anything that we've just been reading? Any parts of the text that you found confusing or that you have any questions about? If you can just type in the chat box there.
So the text was written in um, the fifth uh, century BC. Okay, so no other questions at the moment then. Okay, we'll come then to have a look at our Jamboard. Hopefully you'll be able to access this. So I'm just gonna share the link with everybody and then um, we'll just talk you through what we would like you to do here. Um, so I'm just posting the link on here. So can everybody just open that and just check that they're able to, to edit it for me? What you should see when you go onto the link is um, the jam board itself. So please post if you're having any problems accessing that. Oh, okay. So it's, it's, it's telling us that we need you to allow access. Okay, that's fine. I think what we'll need to do then if you're not able to edit this, can you can you see the jam board? Um, it, or will it not allow you to open it at all? We could just display it. Yeah, we'll just display then, it to um, everybody. You can put comments in the chat and we'll make those into sticky notes. And yeah. So um, if I, I'll add some sticky notes to this as you put access to as, um, can everyone see that there? Okay, so we've got five key themes that we think come from the text. So these key themes then, okay, so was, um, is there a fate that, um, Oedipus was in store for Oedipus. So was he fated to um, marry his ma mother and kill his father? Or were his actions partly his own doing? And secondly, what was the role of gods in this? Where do you see gods being mentioned and what role do you think they played in human affairs? Thirdly, what does this tell us about kingship? What is the role of the king? What is the nature of authority? Who makes those rules? and why and how can authority be questioned i'm going to type this in the chat as well yeah thanks jane um also we've got the idea of sins of the fathers and moral values what are the moral values that are, are, are thought to be important within this play are there certain things that the greek citizens think are important and that they're trying to uphold here and finally, where do you see anything about prophecies and rituals, which were a really important part of the ancient Greek world? So if you feel that you have any answers to those questions, if you can just start typing anything, any ideas or any comments into the chat box for us, and then we'll add them to the jam board. Jane, do you want to uh, call out any comments that they've got and then I'll yes. add it to the jam board? Okay, so I've typed in, was this fate on man made? What is the role of gods? What is the role of prophecies and rituals? Um, should I say, what is the role of kingship and authority? And authority. And yep, so fate, role of gods, kingship and authority. Um, what was the thing about sins of the father? Sins of the father stroke moral values and prophecies and rituals. Yeah, yeah. And what does this say about moral values? Is there anything that you'd like to add? Uh, feel free to start typing those in now. Well, Mariam said it could have been his fate since Apollo often intervenes through prophecies. Um, Mariam, can I ask, I spoke to someone when I was doing the telephone interviews who had already done some classics. Was that you, Mariam? Okay. Well, well done, Mariam, then. Um, Shall I type on top that in yeah. I think that's that's a very fair thing to say. I think a, a lot of the gods often did intervene in human affairs. You see that particularly with the texts that you, um, some, some of the ancient Greek texts from Homer, where, for example, in the war in Troy, um, people like um, Apollo and Athena often intervene on one side or the other in that particular war. Um, Actas has made a very good comment as well. He said, was there a form of divine right in kingship? 
Oh, yes. Nice link again with the 17th century. So I think that, Excellent. yeah, that's good. I think slightly different in ancient Greece in terms of the fact that the ultimate king was seen as Zeus himself, who was the king of the heavens. But I think that certainly kings at this time in, in ancient Greece were seen as having kind of quite a unique connection um, with, with the gods and therefore having kind of a special authority. And I suppose I'd encourage you to, to look within this text at how Othello actually gained his kingship. How, how did he become king? Did... And actually, that's a point, Actus, I'm going to come back to later when we actually talk about the content of the course and the world of the hero, but we'll come back to that. So did you get a sense in the play of how he became king? Because he wasn't actually, he wasn't originally a citizen of Thebes where he became king. So, so did you pick up on like how he became king? It, it, there's actually a connection with the Sphinx. Has anybody heard of the Sphinx before? I'll type it in so that people can. Oh, Jack says a glorified cat. Yeah, yeah, excellent. I really like that description. That sums it up very really nicely, actually. Well yeah, absolutely. And what does the Sphinx do, Jack? Oh, Mariam has said he answered the Sphinx questions. Excellent. excellent. Well done. That's fantastic. Yeah. So, so, um, so, sorry, not Odysseus. He was even. <laughs> There's so many connections between these characters. So Oedipus has actually answered the two riddles set by the Sphinx. And that has meant, uh, because the Sphinx was kind of a um, really troubling the citizens of Thebes. And as a result of this, the Sphinx lost authority and Oedipus gained the title of king. What does that tell us then about how kings can be made? What do they need to do? What is one of the things you can do to become a king? How, how, what is one of the things that can help to raise you to power? Oh, Jack's made a good comment. He said manipulation. Jack, I'm saving these because I this will really help when we get to world of, talk about world of the hero. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. So what, what is he manipulating, Jack? Uh, controlling the way people think in your favour. Excellent. Um, Actas has also said about in ancient Greek, Greece, I believe physical strength led to power. Fantastic. And both these, yep. yeah, that's really good. Yeah, and particularly you see this with somebody like um, Heracles or Hercules, don't you? Um, the idea of like power being kind of one of these kind of things that the Greek people really valued. Um, and I think that's definitely part of the case with... Um, with Oedipus. So we've got a lot of different routes to kingship, haven't we here? But we've also got this sense as well that if you do something that is against the king, if you try to undermine the king's authority, that's also kind of a negative thing as well. Um, in particular, when he starts to talk to Creon, he's saying that Creon wants to take power away from him. So there's always a sense that in the ancient Greek world, power can be challenged and power can be challenged quite often. Um, and uh, and and that's kind of that leads sometimes to power struggles between these different individuals. Then, good, excellent. Did anyone have any comments on the other key factors that we could look at here? So, anything about moral values? Do you see any particular moral values coming through in this play? What do you think the Greek people thought were important? Or things that should be banned or not allowed that were kind of against the natural order or the natural way of doing things? 
Oh, at does it said um, black magic was banned. So you think sort of witchcraft, um, sorcery. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, that was definitely frowned upon. In, in the text itself, what do you think was the ultimate sort of taboo that this text was referring uh, to? Marianne has said incest being a taboo, yes. Excellent, good, Jay. Yeah. Okay, this is one of the really key thing, one of the really key problems for Oedipus is that he does unknowingly actually marry his mother and kill his father, which is where, if you're doing psychology, you'll be aware of the term Oedipal the Oedipus com complex comes from, okay, this kind of apparently secret desire that all men have to marry their mother, okay, coming from Freud. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely kind of a taboo of incest. Um, is, there, is it possible, do you think, for um, Odysseus in relation to that? So Oedipus, is it possible for him to escape his fate? Like Tiresias, the priest, has come, like the prophet has told him that he he's, this is going to happen. Is it possible for him to escape his fate? Jack says no. <laughs> I think you're right, Jack. Yeah. I think it's very difficult. You know, in a lot of the Greek tragedies, there's basically this sense that a human is caught in this kind of cruel world that is actually very difficult uh, for them to be able to escape the things that have been destined for them. Um, so there is certainly a sense. I don't know if, Jane, you picked out anything in the text in terms of that kind of the um, idea. There of are the, things where it, sometimes I find that things it's kind of halfway between. So you feel that they do have some agency. But um, ultimately, yeah, they, they're, they're in the hands of the gods. They, they, um, Someone has said, what if he stayed with his adoptive parents? Exactly. But because he became, and if he'd stayed with his adoptive parents, the, the prophecy would not have come true, would it? So, it, yeah, that's a good... Um... And, and Oedipus tries very hard to escape this prophecy. He actually deliberately stays away from his parents because he thinks that, you know, he doesn't want this to happen. So actually, you know, there is a sense that he's trying to escape, but he can't. So he's trying to do what he thinks is the right thing, but he still ends up in this situation in the end anyway. So MA has raised a hand. Did you have a question? I don't know if you can put the microphone on or how this works. I don't know that people can. If you can type it into the chat, that'd be really good. Um, one thing, uh, a lot of this, what's interesting about this is a lot of th these themes repeat and repeat. So we, um, I was going to say a thing about prophecies and rituals that we see a lot about um, Teresius' role. It says about learning from the birds. That was to do with um, the ritual that they had of um, using the entrails of the bird to um, predict, foresee events. What I was going to say as well, when we were talking about incest and taboo, uh, this actually goes really well with sociology too. It's a great subject to do with them um, alongside sociology. Hello, if you've just joined, we're just looking at a Greek play. We're just analysing the themes in a Greek play here. We're looking um, at classics. And we, we also kind of had a sense in the text as well that actually um, it was the gods that are more important than the kings. So the prophet who's speaking on behalf of the gods and their wisdom actually has more authority and wisdom than um, than Oedipus himself, who was described as being blind and unable to see. So this idea of sight and blindness runs through a lot of the tragedies, you know, humans not being able to fully understand their fate or what's expected of them. Um, MA has asked, uh, is this only for classics or is there going to be a history taster session? Uh, what we, um, we, I think I can answer this. That basically, what we've done is um, Karina will recap. Karina is the um, history teacher for A level history. We'll recap what's covered in history. But what we wanted to do is because we offer classics as well and they go together well, um, was to give people uh, more of a taste of classics because most of you will be studying history already at GCSE. But Karina will. Um, Karina will. Um, 
we'll just recap the main uh, points of the A-level history. Jack says, how many lessons a week do we do? Oh, well, we'll come to that in a second, Jack. When we have a look at the logistics, we'll kind of talk through how the lessons work in a moment. I, I mean, we're kind of running as one. Yeah, I think we'll just, we'll, we'll just be, so, so just to recap on the kind of key themes that we've speak, been speaking about here, what we do in terms of classics is we actually study kind of three, we study two tragedies and we study one comedy. Oedipus Rex is one of the tragedies that we actually study in A-level classics. So if you're particularly interested in theatre, arts, culture, actually these are really kind of interesting things to explore. Um, and lots of really interesting ideas there about humanity and about the role of, particularly if you're interested in ancient cultures, you know, there's there's lots of links with the modern world, but it's also an exciting subject to study because it's kind of takes you into a di very different culture and a very different society and way of life. And I think hopefully kind of some of the things that we've been discussing there are ones that you can think, yes, actually these are kind of quite interesting things that we might be looking at in other subjects, including things like English, if you're studying English too. So I'm just going to go on to, to try and answer some of those questions. Hopefully we've given you a little taster in terms of like what the um, what the plays are about. Um, obviously, the important point that we want to get across here is that the influence of these ancient civilizations is all around us. So they provide all of the foundations from which modern knowledge comes. So drainage, street lighting, literature, art, drama, philosophy. We look at a lot of philosophy texts. So if you're studying philosophy, classics is a really great subject to study. We know the most famous playwright ever, Shakespeare, was influenced particularly by a writer called Plutarch. So he actually takes a lot of his texts uh, or a lot of his text ideas and his language from the Greeks and the Romans themselves as well. And also classics is a really great subject to study because it's seen as one of the kind of really kind of traditional elite subjects. Um, it's one of those subjects that employers really like to see people coming through with. Um, and it gives you, it develops a lot of really important skills too. Um, and so in terms of A-level classics, if you're interested in studying A-level classics, we study, um, Jane teaches the world of the hero. Yeah, so that we look at um, Homer's Odyssey in the first year and Virgil's Aeneid in the second year. Um, a lot of the themes that we talked about now are the sort of things that you look at when you're studying these texts. So we're looking at things that came up. Um, you, I think it was Jack or someone said about, um, you know, uh, outwitting the Sphinx. And a lot of the time they have these things called epithets, these wily Odysseus, um, clever Odysseus, brave uh, uh, Odysseus. Uh, physical strength is a big factor. The fact these sort of king-like qualities, warrior, these things. So it's examining um, the literature, but also looking at what this means in terms of the world of the hero. Uh, Karina does the other two options, which I'll let her speak to you about. So the Greek theatre, as I said, so we examine kind of like, firstly, what the Greek theatre was, how they put on plays, why plays are important. We look a bit at the historical context of the time as well. So we look at why certain plays are being produced, particularly in the context of wars that take place between Greek and Persia and how that affects what Greek playwrights are writing about. And in the process, we learn a lot about what is important important to the Greeks themselves as well, um, what being essentially what being a human means and what is the human's relationship with their gods. And then we also, this is a really exciting topic, we also look at love and relationships in ancient Greece and Rome. So we don't like to leave women out of our study here. So we look very much at kind of the idea of love and romance, marriage. We look at three poets um, and writers. So we look at Ovid, um, we look at um, Sappho, who was actually one of the uh, kind of first uh, lesbian poets to be published. And we look at her views on things like same-sex relationships. So in essence, what we're doing is we're reading a lot of really interesting texts and exploring some really interesting ideas that are still really relevant philosophically today as well. So those are the three units we do. I think there are a few questions about the practicalities of it. Jane's already said that this is an exam-based course and you have four lessons a week of about an hour, hour each. Um, and it is a very, very exciting course. And yeah, we're really looking forward to, to teaching on it next year. Um, we also have links um, with um, mm. King's College, 
Um, so there are, before COVID, we were able to go on trip, quite a lot of um, trips. We went to the theatre to see a Greek play. Obviously, at the moment, that's online, but we've got strong links with King's. And we do, we run a King's Classics programme. So it's actually kind of leading classicists um, from across the UK and even the, who are well known kind of in the wider world as well. So people like Edith Hall, who actually helped our students to put on a play, um, a Greek play last year, which we performed at King's. So we have lots of interesting links and we take visits to King's College and to other important sites in in London and we have two of our students unfortunately I haven't been able to upload the video but we had two students who were on the classics program last year who have now gone on to study classics at university so one of them is going to Edinburgh and the other one's going on to study classics at Oxford and they loved the subject so much they got so engaged with the plays and the literature and you know the multidisciplinary aspects of it that they really wanted to choose to go on to study that further. So um, we're hoping that they're going to come in and do some mentoring with our students next year as well. So um, for marketing, I was saying, um, yeah, I know I've, I've picked up on that. There's a, that quite a few of them are interested, just a little bit of a, just for you to just. Um, that's, like, yeah, that's yeah, what I'm going to go on to yeah, do next. Yeah. yeah. So, so these are the links to A-level history. So at A-level history, we're studying the rise and fall of the British Empire. So we're looking at countries like um, Africa, we're looking at the Indian Empire, we're looking at Britain's relationship with the United States, and we're looking at why the empire rises and also like what happens in the process of decolonization, what happens in those countries and those societies when those countries are decolonized and when the British choose to leave. And also importantly, what are the effects of people that live in those countries as well? And we also look as well, the second unit is 17th century British history. So we're looking at the period between 1625 and 1660. And we're looking at the reasons why there was a civil war in England, why King Charles was executed in 1649. And then also what happened to the British Republic under Oliver Cromwell and why did it only last until 1660. So hopefully what you can see there is a lot of links between history and classics. So if you're interested in studying um, history, then you might also be interested in doing classics because of the overlap in the themes. You know, the Greeks and Romans had an empire. We talk very much about concepts of democracy in history. We look at the role of kingship and authority. We look at art and culture of the period. And we look at ideas about like, what is a citizen? Like what helps you to belong to a country or to an empire and how do we view people who are separate to us who we might define as barbarians because they have different cultures and different ways of doing things so there's a huge amount of overlap and the other important overlap as well is in terms of the skills that you'll be developing i mean a level history we tend to look a lot at written documents um, but obviously, um, we also um, kind of, um, in, in classics, analyse a wide range of other source material. So we'll look at things like the archaeology, material remains. Uh, we look at literature, we look at philosophical texts. Uh, we look at uh, things like what do vases and pottery tell us. Uh, we look at buildings and statues. So actually, it gives you a really good background as a historian because you're learning to work with a much wider range of source material. And you're also really importantly critically analysing the past and thinking about how does the past link with the present? What is the value of kind of the ideas and themes that we're discussing in terms of the modern day as well? So I think history and classics are like a perfect combination to do alongside each other um, if you're kind of interested in the humanities more broadly. Um, I'm just typing in, someone's asked, what other subjects link to history? I'll just type this in as you're talking. <laughs> yeah, basically, <laughs> like any any subject really within humanities, English, social sciences links with history, because history is all about studying humanity, the development of humanity. Um, it's all about looking at how, why the world is as it is. And I think that anything that you do in the humanities uh, field in English, sociology, psychology, link really well with the themes that we're exploring. But also it's all about kind of developing your arguing skills and your written skills and 
uh, kind of really developing the way that you you think and you analyze information as well. So like in a sense, kind of any of those subjects go with history. So it's kind of a case of picking the things that you're most interested in doing. Um, but also, I mean, if you're thinking about, for example, you know, kind of doing a combination of subjects, like for example, this year we had a student who's doing, who's actually the student who's going on to Oxford, who's doing, who was studying biology, psychology and history, because what that enabled her to do was to decide what path she wanted to go down, whether she wanted to go down the psychology route or whether she wanted to kind of keep the humanities route open. Um, so you can be doing kind of a broader range of subjects, depending on what your ultimate career and university aims are, if you know that at this point. A couple more questions. Um, Nazarene has asked what we cover in history. I think Karina's already gone over that, but I'm wondering whether you meant um, it, it, there is a coursework element, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. so we do do coursework. Um, so um, we've actually... Um, at the moment, we're doing African-American civil rights movement in the 20th century, but we're also hoping to open up an option on uh, medieval um, African kingdoms. So if anybody's interested in looking at kind of the African period before slavery and like how important and significant African history was, that is another option that you can choose as well. Um, oh, Jack, are you saying... So that's and that's twenty percent of your um, overall grades. And um, Jack, you're saying, how do I change my subject? So what are you thinking about changing from and to? He said sociology to business A level. Oh, okay. Uh, probably the best thing is to talk to somebody from the advice and recruitment team. So you should, they may put their email address in here in a moment, but um, they probably, you probably got an email address as well that um, they've given to you when you um, came for interview. So just um, contact them to, to let them know that you'd like to, to change your subjects there. Uh, marketing have said as well they can look at the A level. It, it's probably a good idea. What we wanted to do was because um, somebody said, would well, there not be many past papers? Uh, we, it's new to being offered as A level here. It's not a new subject, classical civilization. It's been around for years. So there are lots of um, practice papers and things like that. It's not. Um, and, and really, as Jane said, the best thing you can do to prepare for something like that, particularly if you love reading, this is why classics are so great. Like the texts are amazing. Like when you read the plays and you read the books, um, honestly, they're so gripping. So, like, just just read around, like, over the summer, okay? Just pick up books and plays that kind of interest you. Um, and really, that is that is definitely the best thing that you can be doing. Um, I'm just trying to remember if there were any other questions. So, marketing is suggested. Um... If you want to prepare for history over the summer break, um, then I, I'd, I'd recommend probably just reading around anything on the 17th century British history. So anything related to the English Civil Wars and um, the British Republic. Um, I'll put on some recommendations um, for uh, further reading as well. So if we if marketing are able to give us email addresses or, or for, to contact people who have attended today, then I can send around a wider reading list. Um, if, if it's possible as well, we'll also put a reading list onto our web page online as well so we can give you some suggestions but basically anything on on Charles the first anything on Cromwell anything on the British Empire um so like just to give you a sense of like why the British were wanted to gain an empire what they did when they were there what the effects of of it were afterwards for the people who lived there as well um but yeah I'll try and provide you with some some additional reading as well. Um, Nazarene has asked again about history, do we have the subject specification? Um, where can we find the yes. topics? So if so. you look on, so we're with AQA, so if you look at the AQA syllabus online, you'll be able to find the specification on there. So um, if you look for, um, I think it's, I can't remember the exact unit uh, names, but if you look for the British Empire unit and the English Revolution unit. Type that in. So British Empire and English Revolution. Those those are the two to look for on the AQA website. Um, I'll put um, I'll put in the um, the classical civilization. It's OCR. Yep.
So I think that's I think that's everything from us at the moment. I don't want to run over because I'm aware that you may have another session that you need to attend shortly. And um, if anybody does have any other questions, then please feel free to stay on the line or to continue to type them in there. It was really lovely to meet with all of you today. And hopefully we've given you a taste of what classics involves and how that links also with A-level history if you're choosing to take that. Um, and um, hopefully we'll look forward to seeing you um, in September um, and hope that you have a wonderful summer and um, a well-deserved rest as, as well after this year. Okay, thanks. Everyone. Take care, everybody. Bye. And see you soon. Bye. Bye.